All right, everybody, good morning. My name is Caitlin Yeager, Director of Heritage Programs for Missouri Humanities. Our mission is to enrich lives and strengthen communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. Thank you so much for joining us today for Chapter 7 of Explore Missouri's German Heritage, an eight-part program series that delves into each chapter of the book of the same title by W. Arthur Merhoff. The series concludes next month with our final chapter discussion on April 8th. Can you believe it? We're almost there. <laughs> the book is available for purchase too. I will be posting the link to buy the book in the chat box on Zoom and in the comments on the Facebook Live video. They are $25 each and all proceeds will help us continue to bring free public programs such as these to Missourians. Whether you're joining us through Zoom or watching on Facebook Live, we invite you to be part of the conversation. If you're on Facebook, feel free to comment to let us know you're watching or to ask questions for us to consider. If you're on Zoom, feel free to submit questions in one of two ways. You can either use the chat box or the Q&A feature and we'll try and answer as many as possible throughout the program. So you can submit questions from start to finish and we're not gonna just save them for the end. We're gonna answer questions throughout. If you enjoy our program today and are interested in seeing more from Missouri Humanities, please check us out on Facebook or on our website for the most up-to-date information about our events. We also have a membership program where benefits include free books, discounted tickets to special programs, and access to members-only events. To become a member, visit mohumanities.org and click Memberships under the Donate tab. After our program today, I'll be sending everyone an email with a link to our program survey. I would really appreciate it if you could all take the time to let us know what you thought of the presentation. These surveys are so important as we continue to bring public programming to Missourians and work toward a more thoughtful, informed, and civil society. Our discussion today will feature a conversation between myself and Dr. Arthur Merhoff, of course, and Mark Hausman, the Executive Director of the Washington Historical Society and Museum. And we'll be talking about different ways we remember Missouri's German heritage through things like museums, festivals, and funerary traditions, to name a few examples. If you missed any of our last discussions, here's a very brief overview of what we've covered so far. So chapter one served as a bit of an introduction to Missouri's German heritage and Arthur and I discussed many of the efforts that have been made in recent years to preserve and commemorate that heritage. During our discussion of chapter two, we were joined by Dr. Petra DeWitt and our discussion centered around cultural identity and conflict for German Americans in Missouri. For chapter three, our discussion focused on German immigration into Missouri, specifically immigrant groups and German immigrant communities that were established. Kathy Schopenhorst, a local historian from Warren County was our special guest. Our discussion of chapter four centered around the theme of shaping the land and the sense of place within Missouri's German heritage corridor and beyond. During chapter five's discussion, we discussed German industries such as beer brewing, agriculture, viticulture, and more with Cindy Brown, formerly of Deutschheim State Historic Site. And finally, last month's discussion of chapter six featured our special guest, Katie Homer, the current site administrator for Deutschheim State Historic Site. And we talked about the many facets of everyday life for Missouri Germans. If you would like to go back and view these past discussions, they are all available on our website under the videos tab, as well as on our Facebook page. So now that we're all caught up, I'd like to turn this over to Arthur to introduce himself um, into the stage a little bit for our discussion, and then he'll also introduce our special guest, Mark. So Arthur, I'll go ahead and let you start. I'm unmuted. Is that you are? <laughs> all right. Um, been working on that really, really hard. And uh, again, thanks to everyone um, for tuning in. I guess is how we call it. I, I guess. Uh, but anyway, it's. Uh, when Kaylin said this is the next to last episode, um, a bit of a shock. Uh, a lot has gone on in the last seven months. So we're very lucky to be here and uh, very glad to have you joining us. Um, this chapter, Der Geist, um, most of you are familiar with the concept of a ghost, the Holy Ghost, Der Heilige Geist. Um, but as Germans use this, term especially, it became uh, referred more to sort of an indefinable or essential spirit. And that's really what we're trying to get at, uh, looking at uh, how museums, festivals, and even funerary traditions can help communicate some essential nature of the, our Missouri's German heritage or Geist, if you will. Um, real quickly, I 
worked, uh, did graduate work at St. Louis University in material culture studies in the American Studies program and worked at the Museum of Westward Expansion at the Gateway Arch uh, as a park service ranger. So I have pictures of me in my, my outfit. So that, boy, that was a long time ago, is all I can say. And, uh, and then for about 10 years worked as the academic coordinator for the Museum of Arts and Archaeology at the University of Missouri, trying to work with faculty and others to try and make the resources of the museum, the material culture, if you will, um, a more valuable educational and teaching resource. And in that role as academic coordinator, I got to participate in the German Heritage um, Corridor Initiative that uh, Dr. Steve Belko from Missouri Humanities inaugurated. And uh, um, got, as you've seen throughout the course of this, these programs have gotten to work with some incredible people and that trend continues today. Um, I had a chance to work on the steering committee with um, Mark Hausman and uh, also attend some symposia with him. And Mark was absolutely essential to, to my research for this publication. When I say I'm the author of this publication, I, I mean that, that uh, I would still be working on it if not for Mark and Cindy Brown. So uh, um, I can't thank, you know, thank Mark enough. And it's a pleasure to, to have him join us today to talk about museums, festivals, and especially the, uh, the cemeteries and the funerary traditions. Um, so Mark, if you would, just a bit of background. I know that you're the executive director of the Washington Missouri Museum, but uh, um, a little bit of what do you think is important for people to know about your background? Well, uh, thank you very much, Arthur and Caitlin. It's nice to be here today. I want to say that coming right out of the shoot. Uh, I am the director of the Washington Historical Society. Next month, uh, we'll recognize 20 years that I've been there. And of course, mm -hmm. where did those 20 years go? <laughs> I, I can only account for about 14 of them, I think. Um, uh, however, I do come from a background in funeral service uh, that training is in, and I spent 11 years working at a, a funeral home, and it was actually in that role that uh, I got involved in the local history scene. Uh, the uh, Washington Historical Society was, was purchasing a new building, and they called the owner of the funeral home I was working for and said, uh, uh, you know, hey, would you be interested in, in helping us fundraise to, to purchase this building? And I'll never forget, I was sitting directly across from my boss, and, uh, and he said, well, I'll do it, but only if Hausman uh, is the co-chair, because he said, quote, he's actually interested in such things. <laughs> so, <laughs> I... Yeah, if I hadn't known my place before, I, I, I learned it. But uh, so I was quickly thrust into the, the local history scene. But I had been interested in it since uh, since I was a child. My one of my some of my favorite childhood memories actually uh, involves going to the cemeteries where my ancestors were buried with some of the older folks in the family, and you know putting you know those those wonderful cheap plastic flowers out uh, for Memorial Day and, uh, and, and just wondering, you know, my, my great aunt, you know, take me by the hand and she'd say, now this is so-and-so and this was, this was your great grandmother's sister. And so uh, it just really uh, instilled a deep love of uh, family and genealogy and local history. And then of course, as, as we age, we realize that all history is local history, and and um, at some point, I think that's inarguable. And uh, also, you know, world history is our history by the same token. So that ought to be enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, Caitlin, what do you think? I think that uh, that's a, a nice segue because we've got, uh, and I love that this happened to line up so nicely, these these themes with, you know, what you've worked on, you know, and, and two kind of 
seemingly very different industries, you know, uh, <laughs> funeral, you know, funerary traditions and, and funeral work with, with museums and, and cultural institutions. And, but again, you know, as you mentioned there, it's really quite a natural link. Um, and we're, we're going to make those links today, hopefully. Right. Um, but, but I'd like to start off with uh, talking about museums. Um, so this is the, the first essay in, uh, in the book. And uh, so calling upon both examples in the book and Mark, your experience as the director of a small town museum, um, I wanna dig into the importance of small town museums kind of overall um, and their role in remembering, interpreting and celebrating Missouri's German heritage, especially as compared to um, say some of the bigger institutions that we tend to, to visit here in Missouri. Um, you know, why are these small town museums so important? Mm -hmm. Well, I think to, uh, to go to the, the very beginning of, of that, um, you know, as a, as a small town museum, we're, a, you know, we're a nonprofit. We have been since 1959. But, you know, as part of all of that, even registering as a nonprofit, you know, you have to come up with bylaws and guidelines. And, and as an example, the Washington Historical Society only collects and, and saves and maintains uh, things relative to Washington, Missouri, or its immediate area. And sometimes folks have a, a little bit of a difficulty in understanding that. So I use the example of, um, you know, if someone brings in a, uh, a, a clipping of uh, Mrs. Franz Schwarzer's hair with an old ribbon tied around it, you know, we're, we're going to keep that because <laughs> it was the zither maker's <laughs> wife's hair. Now, don't go to the bald thing. Nothing was meant by that. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> but the the opposite being, uh, if someone walks in with the bell off of that Titanic, I have to reject that. You know, now mm -hmm. of course that bell should be somewhere in a museum, uh, or stay at the bottom of the ocean. However, <laughs> you, want, you want to argue that. Uh, speaking of memorializing the dead, but. Uh, yeah, so I, I think there is there there is a real difference there. You know, you go to a small town museum, you, uh, often you're not sure what you're going to see. Sometimes uh, it's more of a, a collection of antiques. And uh, Ralph Gregory, our late curator, the founder of our historical society, used to pound his fist on the desk. Uh, he, he would do that quite often, and uh, he would say, "We're not an antique shop. We are." <laughs> antique shop <laughs> and of course what he meant by that is yeah that was pretty much what we're talking about um you know we we want to be more than a collection of antiques we love antiques but uh you know that antique without a story you know it's the story behind the object just i think yesterday someone asked me about something in the museum and and uh, i i told them the story behind it uh, they said, wow, that's, that's really interesting. And I thought, well, there's another example of, uh, it, we use the objects to tell the stories. And um, I think, you know, to do that on a small town level and to try to do it uh, successfully, you know, that, well, that's what, that's what our organization is all about. <laughs> Mark, we actually have a perfectly timed question for right now. Well, Norman asks, what if someone from Washington was on the Titanic? Would you keep the bell? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. That, that's a great question. Uh, in that case, yes, we would probably take the bell from the Titanic. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent point. You mm -hmm. know, we just, uh, I just opened our local newspaper this morning, uh, and, and there's an article in there about this automobile that we are now displaying in our museum. And this automobile was made in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And you think, well, now see Houseman, you're not telling us the truth. It's not a locally significant object, but it was, we believe it to be the second automobile purchased by a resident of Washington. So it's a 1908 economy motor buggy in case you wanna drag yours out of the compare it to this one. Uh, so yeah, it it in there too. Then then the bell from the Titanic would be telling a story about Washington resident. So 
Yeah. That's I, what Mark's talking about is so essential to museum work. Um, what do we keep? What, you know, what's the difference between, like you said, an antique store, a junk shop, and a museum? And it's the collection itself. What is the purpose, the scope of the collection? But also the work, there's another key element, and I became very much more familiar with that uh, working at the Museum of Art and Archaeology, curation, caring for these objects. Um, many of them, if not priceless, certainly valuable and have to be maintained under certain conditions, for example, um, <clears throat> and preserved and moved and, and then also displayed. And then part of the curation is classifying, categorizing, and gathering research and information about those objects. And then as Mark pointed out, very appropriately interpreting or communicating the stories. And some museums don't really get beyond those first two. And you know, that's, that's fine, that's, that's their prerogative, I think. But without communicating or interpreting those objects, the difference between that and a junk shop uh, well, hopefully you've cared for these items, but you know, uh, you're not really telling the story or you know, interacting with people in a way that tells a meaningful story or communicates a heritage. Right. We, we have uh, people <coughs> often ask me, you know, oh, what, what do you think is the most interesting object in your museum? You know, they, they want to go directly to that or learn, you know, what what in my opinion is the most interesting and and sometimes they'll say and, and what's the most you know ridiculous you know what in this museum should maybe have been thrown away but but but, <laughs> but wouldn't have been if not for the story and we we have about a an eight inch section of wooden sewer pipe on display in our museum it, it it's uh i think it's a hardwood uh, sewer pipe with with wire wrapped tightly around it, and it, uh, it but it was dug up on Cedar Street in downtown Washington, Missouri, about forty years ago during some street repairs or what have you. Well, I didn't ever realize that there were wooden sewer pipes, and I especially didn't didn't uh, realize that we had them in Washington, Missouri, but. We now have a hunk of wooden sewer pipe that uh, <laughs> tell tells the story. <laughs> right. it, it, it tells some. It tells a story that somebody appreciates, and I think that's also an important part here. Um, not only is it important to have local museums as well as you know regional museums, state museums like Deutschheim State Historic Site, Museum of Westward Expansion, or the Harry Truman uh, Library. National World War I Museum in Kansas City, fabulous museum. But it's also important to collect, uh, to show a range of perspectives. It's not just all beautiful artwork. It's somebody <laughs> was making uh, those sewer pipes, somebody was making those automobiles. And I think it's important to portray the lives of you know, ordinary Missouri Germans um, as well as you know, like we see on page 117 in the publication, the Palmer Gentner House, a beautiful historic uh, structure on the National Register, certainly worth preserving, but just down the block is the uh, Australia House, which is more characteristic of the lives of ordinary um, Missouri Germans. So again, having a range of stories and materials in order to let people, in a sense, tell their own story, or at least, you know, interpret um, from a variety of perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think too, um, and Arthur, that that brings up a great point, which I think is that small town museums have an even bigger role. I feel in in something like telling the story of Missouri's German heritage, because so many communities that were founded by German immigrants in Missouri were founded by immigrants from certain parts of Germany and would have maybe had different cultural traditions, different dialects, um, you know, different ways of life. So 
what to some might be an overarching theme of, of Germanness in Missouri to individual town museums. It's talking about the people of that community that are different and maybe come from a completely different place than the next community over. Um, you know, we've got several communities named for the places in Germany where they where they originally immigrated from. So I think that you know is talking about telling a broader context of a story, but also piecing together um, the smaller spaces. You know, it's filling in the blanks mm -hmm. to tell it's like a mosaic, story. if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah it um, is. But um, anthropologists might talk about the ethos, the cultural ethos that's represented in German. Um, the, con the concept of the folk guys or the you know, spirit of the people. And it could be you know, from one duchy, um, it's different than another, or maybe there are things that unite you know, all Missouri Germans. So trying to get at that guys is part of what these, our museums can do. Mm -hmm. I, we, we've heard so many stories over the years in, in Washington uh, where it, uh, in an eclectic sense uh, was <laughs> many German communities within one, you know, some of these smaller communities were pretty much strictly settled by, you know, family groups or other organized societal moves, you know, from Germany to a particular point in Missouri, uh, whereas Washington was sort of its own melting pot. And, and, you know, a lot of the old timers have told me, well, you know, we were, we were German, but the people who lived right next door to us were German, and and we couldn't speak this speak the same language. You know, that just the difference in the dialect. You know, they had a very difficult time in communicating, and I I think that's something that a lot of folks may not really grasp. Mm -hmm. But but yet the printed word in German seemingly they could both read. Mm -hmm. You know, if and. Uh... What's interesting too is, you know, you talk about within a community, there are different communities. You know, a really great example of that is down in Perry County. Um, I mean, to this day, there are, are kind of, there's this kind of feeling of, you know, you belong to one, one kind of German or another kind of German. I don't want to misspeak and say what the two ones are. And Arthur, if you know, please, I know one is Baden and I don't want to mis, mis, you know, misrepresent them and say what the other one is, but um, you know, and for a long, long time, there were, it was almost, you know, competition or conflict between the two groups because they had different religions, different dialects and different customs, but they were settled in the mm -hmm. same area. Um, I mean, they have, even to this day, they have different museums. So um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting, you know, concept that, that has carried through time. And it's, it's purely today, it's an example of people who are just really trying to preserve the uniqueness of where they came from. Um, and I know that uh, someone asks about the different dialects and Mark, you brought that up, but I know that there is, there are very few people, I think maybe one person in particular that I know has been in the news down in Perry County. That's one of the last people to be able to speak a certain dialect of German and he's trying to preserve it, trying to get it documented. So um, this opens up a lot of different discussions of, of, you know, how smaller communities and the cultural institutions in smaller communities are striving to, to maintain these smaller but equally important parts of German cultural heritage. And even, you know, uh, unfortunately, that something that just popped into my head, too, is, is, you know, there were even prejudices, uh, you know, among the immigrant Germans uh, for the same, same reasons, you know, that, well, they don't, they don't speak the same language we do. And uh, I just recently had a lady who's in her 70s tell me uh, that when she was a child, if they were walking uh, in front of or toward one particular church in Washington, that their, their parents made them cross the street as they passed that church. You know, so I guess that the, the, the whatever naughtiness that... that <laughs> might have been projecting would not infect the children because that was not their church. You know, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, wow, that's I really you, interesting. You may have understated it with the word naughtiness, Mark. But, uh, <laughs> um, no, I think your point is very well taken that uh, um, <clears throat> we looked in this chapter at Deutschheim State Historic Site. Um, we looked at the Herman Farm and Museum, which is a private, privately, uh, maintained 
um, museum, really kind of a living history museum. Um, and then also at, um, you mentioned Kaylin down in uh, Perry County, you know, the role of Saxon Lutherans down there and the emphasis there upon preserving that religious, you know, very unique religious heritage. And I just wanted to quickly mention that very often religion was a binding sentiment. You know, as Mark pointed out, you know, the, the churches had power, they were numinous, they, um, people took them very seriously. And so uh, they were also very important in terms of documenting key events in people's lives, births, uh, marriages, uh, deaths, and keeping records and genealogy, as Mark pointed out, these, these are great resources for um, trying to get at the, the meanings that people associated or gave to, to their lives um, at, at whatever level we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Right. And Norman uh, has another comment where he says, where he grew up, there was a bit of divide between the German Catholics and the Protestants. Absolutely. That's, you know, a, one that you see very commonly in different communities is Catholics versus Protestants, not versus, mm -hmm. but you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Um, right. <laughs> Yeah, right. they didn't always play well together in, no. in Europe or in, in America. <laughs> right. True. <laughs> and I think, um, Arthur, you, you talked a bit about the religious institutions and churches, and I think it's a nice segue into um, kind of the next topic we want to talk about, which is festivals. Um, churches were obviously a very, um, they were the center of a community. Oftentimes, that's what started a community was someone, you know, establishing some sort of religious institution. Um, so let's talk about different types of festivals um, and what their purpose is, uh, you know, I know that the typical, you know, someone might just kind of think of something like Oktoberfest as a, a place to, to drink a lot of great beer and have a great time, which is a huge part of it. It's an important part of it. But, um, you know, what is their role? What is a festival's role? These big gatherings that are celebrating something or commemorating something, um, what is their role? And how do different kinds of festivals compare and what their ultimate goal might be? And, and one example we can talk about is the TNT reunion in Walden Spring. Great point. Um, I think that festivals are a form of humanities. That's why it's very important for Missouri humanities to be involved in this particular endeavor. It's, it's really kind of a form of what I consider public theater that's reenacting stories or cultural traditions, but for a contemporary audience. Um, former colleague of mine at St. Cloud State University, Dr. Anthropologist Rob Lavenda, studied dozens of festival, festivals across Minnesota. And you know, who gets to tell the story? And how are those people portrayed? And who doesn't get portrayed? And you know, what, what's emphasized? what's left out. And um, so they can be family traditions, they can be local, regional, national, sacred or secular, but it's always a form of remembering. And I use that term very advisedly. I mean, the opposite of remember is dismember. So, <laughs> you, know, the, and, you know, there's this, the wonderful memorial union at um, University of Missouri and it's got a list of the war dead. And I think, you know, that's the ultimate example of dismembering. But people are asked to tip their caps as they walk through the, those arches to remember, to reconnect or become a member with that community, um, however we associate them. One powerful example I had uh, up in Minnesota, um, I attended a Saint, All Saints Day celebration with the Sisters of St. Benedict at the monastery there. It goes back to the 1850s. And these elderly sisters, you know, after the service, after the mass, would proceed out um, November 1st, All Saints Day, singing hymns and walk through the graveyard. <laughs> you know, many of them were elderly and certainly had thoughts of mortality on their own mind. But they're reacting as reenacting a story and uh, traditions, and it was very powerful. So we can see there, obviously, a, a religious orientation. The TNT reunion, ironically, is um, Mark and I, and well, Caitlin, you were there. Um, 
last I remember before things went crazy is that uh, it's a it's a group that from Hamburg, Missouri, that the town itself was taken or uh, by eminent domain um, and used for uh, munitions plants, I think, during World War II. But the people there continue to celebrate or have a festival. Is it called the TNT reunion? Mm -hmm. Is it really? Okay. Well, that's, that's pretty bold right there. And, uh, so they're, re they're remembering or reconnecting with people um, in a place that no longer exists. So again, remembering, reconnecting, um, and telling a story that still gives meaning to their lives. Um, Mark, your reaction, do you want to talk about TNT? Sure. <laughs> the right. festival, I mean. The whole, the whole thing's gonna blow up now. <laughs> right. No, uh, it, it is interesting, the, the TNT reunion, yeah, I think they've been doing them since maybe the 1970s. And uh, j just that is indicative of, of uh, remem remembrance, you know, by that time, uh, the the uh, the uh, takeover of, of Hamburg, Howell, and Tunerville, three small communities in St. Charles County, was more than 30 years into the past. But as as the folks who were most affected by that uh, uh, were aging, you know, I, I, they decided, hey, there ought to be a way for us to all get together. You know, your family has its little family reunion and your family has a reunion every five years and whatever. But maybe we can combine some of those things. And of course, this is uh, this is one of those, you know, uh, folks carrying in a, a bowl of potato salad with saran wrap on the top of it, which I'm, I don't say it in a bad way. You know, I love uh, potato salad, but uh, uh, it's, it's just so interesting. You know, it gives people an opportunity to, to not only remember, but to learn. And today in that, in that particular environment, there's more learning going on than there is remembering because the older folks, you know, the, the, the Hamburg takeover was 1941. You know, my goodness, that's, that's 80, Hey, I just did some quick math. That's years ago this year. I, I, it just struck me. So yeah. So you know, those who were who were there at that time are more likely to not be here any longer. You know, uh, just just the children, perhaps. Uh, I knew a, a, a gentleman who was was born in in Hamburg in 1919, and he passed away. I guess about seven or eight years ago now, but but he said, uh, been 20 years ago, he said, you know, I'm one of the last ones that I'm aware of, you know, that was born and raised in Hamburg and, and that I lived there long enough. You know, he lived there until he was about 21, 22 years old. And uh, so, you know, all of his childhood memories, uh, you know, grade school, you know, he went to the Hamburg school. His teacher was Miss Ella River, who, who I also remember. I, I remember Miss Ella. Uh, she never married, lived to be about 95 years old, and just a really interesting lady to sit down and talk with. But, uh, you know, this particular gentleman, Les Mattis, uh, he could, and he did, he he took it one step further. He knew that people were interested in, in the stories of, of Hamburg and Howell, and, and he would just gather a few of us together and take us on a hike. You know, he was about 80 years old, and he said, you know, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to do this, but, uh, you know, he showed us, you know, historic remnants of, of the town of Hamburg, which uh, there are few. Uh, and it, it's not uh, just irony, I suppose, that the cemeteries are one of the things that are still there. You know, they are still there. The government, you know, made sure that they were protected for about four years. <laughs> and then it all, you know, went and the whole thing, of course, went went us to the side after, this, after the war was over. But 
Yeah. You, you raised a real important point. I mentioned J.B. Jackson, the great landscape historian, talking about the importance of ruins and pausing reflection and giving people a chance to tell stories, remember, and in a sense to refashion that connection. And I, you know, the remembrance yeah. of Hamburg, I guess, is a classic example. Yes, one of the, one of these walking tours with Mr. Mattis, uh, we went to this little knoll, and there was actually an uncovered cistern there, which was rather scary. You know, it was about a, about <laughs> a go wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> like a, if only Wiley e. Coyote were here. You know, <laughs> but it, there was about, about a four foot diameter, you know, cistern that was just absolutely filled with water, and and. But then a few feet away from there, there was this hunk of rusted metal, literally, literally wrapped around this huge tree. It was like you took a piece of metal and just bended it around this huge tree. And there was a little bit of old green paint on this metal. And Les Mattis looked at that and he said, oh, that's so-and-so's 1927 Chevy. <laughs> and I thought... Now, who, who on the face of the planet is going to know that? There's I mean, a story there somewhere. You bet. I mean, you know, he knew whose home site we were we were at, and, and then he saw the, and he he recognized it as that particular automobile. So yeah, there are just so many little stories like that that uh, are in danger of being lost. But the thanks to that reunion, you know the. The last one I attended, uh, they uh, a descendant of um, an elderly man who who said, "I absolutely will not leave my house. You cannot make me leave my house. This is the United States. I own this farm. This is my." And uh, he refused to leave his house, and and so finally it was you know D Day, and and. Uh, and like four of the government workers went in and, and literally picked up this gentleman in his rocking chair and carried him outside and sat him down. And this, I, I kind of get emotional when I talk about this, but um, a descendant of his brought the rocking chair to, yeah. to the last reunion. So, I mean, you know, and there again, it's, it's just an old rocking chair without the story. And, yeah. And I, I, I've been incredibly lucky to attend a couple of these reunions and, and thankfully, you know, cause we're not, we're not hundred percent sure if they'll continue. Obviously last year's didn't happen. We, it was kind of the height of COVID. These tend to happen in the summer. Um, and, and I haven't heard anything about this year. I, Mark, it sounds like you haven't really either, oh. um, but uh, it would be a shame to lose it, but you know, at least, you know, to be able to have held them for the last 40 some odd years, I think is, is a wonderful accomplishment and a testament, like you said, to um, the importance of gathering, the importance of, of sharing stories. And, um, and I've been on that hike with Mark that he talks about. He took us on that hike. And, and you know, I think it's almost more poignant and more striking that there isn't anything left than if there were things left. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely insane to walk through this area and think that this used to be a nice little bustling town. Um, and I think that that, you know, and, and talking a bit more about festivals, you know, in a broader context, something that comes up a lot with, um, with these gatherings that are celebrating or commemorating, um, is, you know, if they lose authenticity through time, you know, that we talked a lot, you know, you talk in, in the, in the book a bit about how a lot of these festivals are commemorating things or celebrating things that are, you know, harvest season or, or seasonal things, you know, part of just celebrating um, everyday life. But as they've continued through the years, they've grown into what they are today. You know, everyone knows what Oktoberfest looks like. Um, less common, you know, festivals like My Fest or, or uh, Christmas festivals, you know, but um, do festivals have a duty to be authentic? Um, and if they're not authentic, what do we lose? Great question, and it's not an easily resolved one. The question of who's authentic, um, that's not, it's not an either or kind of question. I mean, if we say it has to be the same thing it was 
in the past and makes it a very static, um, almost a folk art. Um, but on the other hand, too much, <laughs> you know, if it's just all about the beer drinking, you lose the connection to the natural world, the agrarian lifestyle. Um, so to me, it's a form of historic preservation. It's an attempt to try and balance change with um, some, something meaningful from the past, but that the meaning is going to change. I think it's very important. And it's, this is not just me speaking, but you know, the World Council of Churches, uh, United Nations, you know, UNESCO has talked about, um, it has to be interpreted, it has to be negotiated and really best, you know, there's a whole series of best practices, but one of the keys is that it benefits the people themselves, that it's um, geared not toward, you know, just making money, but that people in some way have a chance to re retell the story, to recreate and um, keep their heritage alive. But how we do that, um, that's kind of what the German Heritage Corridor Initiative is, is trying to get at. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, of the old phrase, you know, well, how did this tradition begin, you know, and, and, and all the people look at one another and they're <laughs> not sure, you know, I we mean, just it, do to, it. <laughs> to speak, it, right. It just, it's always it's tradition, right? done this way. Right. Yeah. And I you think that, that's great. I mean, you know, but yeah, you know, why do we do these things? Why do we, well, Can you you oh, just hear Tevye, yeah, Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof. Tradition. Yeah. <laughs> right. Everyone right. knows who he is and what God intends them to do. <laughs> That's right. That's I right. was in that show, so I happen to know the line. <laughs> um, so I want to call back a little bit. Um, we had a brief mention of cemeteries, kind of when we we're talking about Hamburg, because that's a, a natural connection to cemeteries because of of what remains of Hamburg. Um, but if if everyone's okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna transition into kind of our our final essay here, um, which is the funerary traditions. Um, and I want to start with, uh, I'm going to switch up our order a little bit. Mark, um, talk about the role of cemeteries in remembering. And I know that might be an obvious question to those of you watching, but um, you know, they're, they're more than just a final resting place with a marker. Um, so what is it, you know, you talk about your childhood and some of your fondest memories are, are exploring cemeteries, especially those that have your family and having someone talk to you about who these people were. So what is the role of cemeteries in remembering? And you can certainly use the Hamburg Cemetery as an example, or if you've got other examples of small town cemeteries, um, I'd love for you to talk a bit about that, especially with your experience. Yes, I'd love to. Uh, well, first of all, I, I look at a tombstone as, as um, not an ending point, but, but a beginning point, uh, meaning, as, as you walk into a cemetery, you approach it, you, you maybe stop and read a headstone because it catches your eye because of its color or its, or its, its massive size or, or, or maybe because it's the smallest gravestone that you, that you see nearby. But it, what's on that headstone? You know, uh, it's a name, it's a date and another date. And uh, that though, to me, that's the book on the shelf. And, and you know, if you, if you want to take the book off the shelf, then that means you're making a choice in learning about that person. In other words, well, maybe I'm stating it too simply, but, but uh, I would do this as a child, you know, someone's name in, in the cemetery would intrigue me. And, and then as I got older, uh, I would, I, and began getting more into local history and genealogy. Uh, I wouldn't just look up my own family members, genealogically speaking, you know, I'd, I'd pick one of those favorite names or favorite monuments, if you will, out of the cemetery. And, and who was that person? Well, I've just learned more than that person's name and the date and the date. You know, uh, you know, I've learned about that. Per who were they? You know, who were their family members? Uh, what was, what did they do in the community? What was their business? Um, what language is is engraved into the headstone? You know, is it English? Is it German? 
Um, in Franklin County, we even have some, uh, some Polish uh, tombstones. And so that, that, just that, still standing in the cemetery, that gives you a sense of community. The ethnicities of, of the people who live, lived and, and died there. And also it speaks to the point of they were still, even in death, they were, if you will, honoring their own past by having the tombstone engraved in the language they were likely still speaking, no matter how long they had been here, you know, that was still their native tongue. And uh, I think that too, well, that could go into a whole other other program about <laughs> did what did they think would be the tradition you know the mm. german language would continue in hamburg missouri perhaps or or it, you know it, it's just hard to say but um i think cemeteries are one of the, the most valuable uh, places to learn about people community uh even uh, society you know what what fraternal organizations were represented within this community. You know, you see uh, the Masonic symbol is, is one of the most recognizable, I suppose. And you see that on, on headstones of uh, people with very English surnames, but also with, with uh, Germanic names. And so, uh, you know, it sort of spans that, that divide that might have has been there, and that's a, that's an interesting thing about some of those type of organizations. They they do they tend to span that gap if if there were to be one. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm rambling, so feel free. No, you're not. There's well, I've, I want I wanted to, to specifically mention Mark's work, the Franklin County, the County Cemetery Society, and uh, um, you know. G.K. Chesterton talked about tradition as the democracy of the dead. And what Mark and his organization have done uh, to care for these headstones and, and cemeteries um, extends full voting privilege to those people and makes them part of our community um, in, in very meaningful ways. It's, it's an incredible thing that you're doing and uh, I, I mean, it's, it's valuable for me to hear how you got to this, but I think it's also valuable for people to hear about what you're, how you're acting upon that, uh, those values. So kudos to you, Mark. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I, I'm very proud of our cemetery society, and uh, we, we save, fix, repair everything that we, we can, and uh, we all in the group, all of us have our different niches, you know, of, of expertise. You know, I hate using the, the uh, caulking gun with the epoxy tube in it. I just cannot master that. It's, it's, <laughs> that's way beyond, you know, you think the Zoom meeting is beyond my technological, <laughs> you know, don't, don't put a caulking gun in my hand. That's way too complicated. So, uh, it, but we all have our little areas of expertise, and mm -hmm. as I'm uh, I'm aging, <laughs> uh, they sometimes just sit me in a lawn chair and let me point. Which I find <laughs> but uh, no, it, uh, <laughs> it it's it's extremely important. Uh, Hamburg Cemetery, great example. Uh, you know what is left to tell the story of Hamburg to someone who doesn't want to go to the library or check out a book or do a little research on the internet. You know, someone's driving along and there's a cemetery. Oh, I like cemeteries, let's stop. And, uh, you know, hey, there must have been something here. You know, there must have been a church. There, there might, have been a, might have been a community. You know, now it's just pretty much wildlife. Mm -hmm. to, a, to a very real extent, you and your colleagues are curators of this above ground collection that spans the entire length of the Missouri heritage, German Heritage Corridor. And the collection's already there, um, but um, yeah. your role as curator is important. And what this thing is about is communicating some of, some of that as well. Right. And we've got a, a comment that relates to that, you know, and Hamburg can be considered, I think, a, 
in relatively speaking, a small town cemetery. Um, but Norman wants to point out, you know, the small family cemeteries too, especially that there's lots yeah. of those pop up on family farms. Many are on the bluffs overlooking the river. Um, and in Hamburg, you know, that's, I think that's a, again, another poignant example of what remains is, you know, going down that that road, that hike to Lower Hamburg, you 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 see a couple family cemeteries peppered in there, and you mm -hmm. know to see a family cemetery, but no house, no obvious marker of of a plot of land. Um, you know, it begs. You know that if that doesn't make you want to figure out what happened here, you know mm -hmm. I don't know what will. So mm -hmm. so those family, you know, especially since I think a lot of a lot of family cemeteries are are you know on land that maybe isn't in the family anymore. And for someone, you know, today to, to honor that and, and keep that maintained, keep it um, as an important part of that piece of land. Um, Cause it, it's part of the story, you know, even though it's not in the family anymore, it's now a part of the story of that place. Right. Right. And, you know, family cemeteries uh, appeared, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, sometimes uh, there was not a, a church close by or, or maybe the, the church that was closest to this particular family's farm was not one that they affiliated with. Uh, but it, that's something we see, uh, you know, not just among the German Americans, but, but, but among uh, the early settlers as well, the early multi-generational Americans who, who came to this part of Missouri too. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. um, Interestingly, uh, Caitlin, you mentioned on the on the river bluffs. Um, someone asked me a few years ago, you know, where where are the the cemeteries, you know, between Washington and 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 Herman? And I said, well, for 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 a starting point, just follow the river and, and go to the highest, most beautiful point. Mm -hmm. I can pretty much guarantee there will be a cemetery on on that, mm -hmm. that high point and. Uh, one in particular near New Haven, uh, little known, uh, there are five Native American burial mounds on this bluff, small, small ones. But the, uh, the early multi-generational Americans that came to Franklin County, they uh, very eh, proudly had their own bodies buried right into the Indian mounds. So they even have a better view, arguably, of the mm -hmm. river than the Native Americans who, who use that beautiful spot for the same reason, because mm -hmm. it's a beautiful spot and you, it's a wonderful view of the river. So, And there's a connection also, I think, to German romanticism in this, because uh, if we look at early cemeteries, they were right next to the church. You had to pass through the you know, the headstones in order to get to the parish church in England, let's say. Um, just a reminder, you know, uh, be careful about your immortal soul. But, uh, <laughs> you know, in German romanticism, that that love of nature um, shows up. And I, Jeff Smith, who was one of our symposia participants, um, has written very well, elegantly about uh, the romantic cemetery movement of the 19th century. So people are interested in this, they could uh, pursue that as well. Right. And Arthur, um, I think you're, you're, you're helping us with some of the things you're talking, transition into the next question, which is um, a term that is super fascinating, I think, and one that I hadn't heard before, which is the term archeology span above ground to describe cemeteries. Um, so I'd love it if you could go a little bit into a little more detail about your choice of words there and, and, and kind of your interpretation of that archaeology above ground. Well, archaeology, I think, is one of the humanities. It's a way to try and understand what it means to be human. The meanings that people, um, you know, Schliemann, the um, first maybe big known archaeologist blowing up nine, nine levels to get down to the ruins of Troy and actually bypassing the original Troy in the process. But, um, <clears throat> you know, in a sense, these markers of these objects that people dig, um, archaeological, di you know, um, expeditions for are right on the surface here with um, the cemeteries. They tell us a lot about the people, the names, 
but also the styles, um, where the cemetery is located, where the headstones are located, you know, how it's the natural features that are used. Um, in a sense, we not recreate the life, we're at least recreating um, some of the stories that people told in, about the meaning of those lives that are interred in those in those graves. So again, it's one of the humanities. It's a way of trying to get at the meanings that people assigned to um, <laughs> the, the lives of those people there and uh, worthy of respect, certainly. Uh, to, to, to that point, Arthur, uh, in our cemetery society, for instance, I sometimes uh, will get a new volunteer on the hook, you know, and, and if you, you talk a little bit about uh, archaeology and, and, and literally digging in the dirt, you know, sometimes someone will get interested in that aspect of cemetery restoration, and, and part of our mission really is truly archaeological in that we sometimes unearth uh, tombstones that have long ago fallen. And, and, you know, of course, our goal is to, to upright them again so that they can be read and interpreted and, and enjoyed by visitors and respected, hopefully, by their descendants and so on. So, yeah, it, uh, it, it really is archaeology, but there's also a little bit of that, that digging involved. Of course, piece of advice, re always be careful being seen carrying a shovel into a cemetery. I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, I've had one or two issues over the years where... <laughs> you sound like the voice of experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we had the... In Washington, we have a cemetery that... that uh, in the 1920s was converted into a public park. Well, okay, fast forward 75 years or 80 years, whatever it was, we got permission to, to unearth the headstones in this park uh, and photograph them, but then if, you know, just put them back and cover them up because they want it to remain a park and not a cemetery. But uh, while we were out there with shovels and so on and digging and looking for tombstones with with probes uh, all of a sudden the washington police department showed up and they said well one of the neighbors uh called us and said you know there are a bunch of strange people out there digging around in, in the middle of the park <laughs> it's not a strange person it's mark osmond right uh well that, uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> that too another whole program <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are, we're getting a little close to time. I want to do a couple things. Um, I have a comment from somebody that I, I want to read because it's a great point and something that Mark, you're the person I learned this from and, and it's still to this day one of the most fascinating things I've learned about um, older, older sites. And then we have a question from Norman. So the comment is um, from Bob. When you walk old or new railroad tracks in the Missouri Valley, you do not usually see grave sites but you'll see daffodils and asparagus growing where a home was located as remembrances of past settlers, probably of German descent. And I remember um, going through the Hamburg site and even right by the cemetery that you pointed out certain plants that would not have grown where they're growing on their own. They would have been intentionally planted for a reason. So um, <laughs> daffodils being a great example that daffodils are, are something that would have been planted for decoration and very commonly used in a yard. Um, so I, I remember seeing daffodils popping up, you know, as I drive down 94, if I see daffodils, I'm like, something was there. Um, so, and, yeah. and things like <laughs> yucca and periwinkle being common too, that would not have no grown on their own, but are markers of what, of that something might've been there before. And I think that's, that's a truly fascinating piece of, of archaeology that, you know, someone might be able to go to a place and see kind of oddball plants. And it makes you wonder, you know, mm -hmm. why, why are those there? They should be something else. And I think in, in Hamburg, the, the trees are a great example, too, of seeing bigger trees that would have been a yard tree versus trees that are more, you know, what it is today, which is kind of overgrown, you know, forest conservation land. Um, so super interesting point, Bob. I appreciate you bringing that up. 
And then the question, and I think I'll direct this to you, Mark, is now that information about cemeteries is online, will there be less interest in maintaining a physical cemetery? Wow, great question. Uh, that one kind of scares me. Uh, I, 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 I'm hoping the opposite is true. I was going to say, I hope. You, I think you hope the answer is no. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, I'm finding folks contacting me as an example. I suppose that uh, they're saying, "Well, I was on the website, you know, findagrave.com. That's the largest one currently out there. That's that's free to access and. And uh, I, you know, I found that, uh, you know, whoever posted some information about my great great grandmother, who I've been searching for for you know thirty years, and and can you tell me, please, the condition of mm -hmm. the gravesite? So now, I mean, that's that's an infrequent happening, of course, but it does happen, and. Uh, We've had our little cemetery society. I've had people mail us donation checks uh, to go out and and uh, you know cut the weeds and and uh, spruce up you know the family plot uh, because you know so and so lives in California and you know I'm in a nursing home and and so uh, you know people are still interested. So I'm hoping the opposite is true. Uh, mm -hmm because the cemeteries are readily available now, so many of them online, that maybe that will lead to someone coming back and saying, hey, we really need to clean this up and make it look respectable again. That's but, a great point. I, I would never have thought of it that way, but that's very <laughs> true. It makes it makes that cemetery a little more widely accessible and, and, and promotes educating yourself about maybe where your family or loved ones might still be. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're running out of time, but Arthur, I know you wanted to end with reading a section from this, this chapter. Um, so I'm going to, if you're ready for that, I'm going to have you go ahead and read the segment that you wanted to make sure people heard. Um, so I'm going to turn that over to you and then we'll, we'll wrap up and, and say, see you next time. But Arthur, uh, take it away. Well, people have heard me say I'm the Arthur of this publication and I hope you never thought that I didn't, I downplay or don't take this very seriously. Um, I, tr I feel like I'm representing um, a cadre of people for whom I have the utmost respect. And uh, so when I say write something, I, it better be good. Uh, my editor, uh, Danita Wood, I had used a poem by Rilke, one of his classic works, um, and she said, no, we need to put it at the front. I go, oh, geez, because now it sets the bar really high. But um, again, this is, it's not just about the cemeteries, but I think it could be applied to this entire effort. In the above ground archeology span of Missouri's German cemeteries, we found in, find an exclamation point placed upon the story of Missouri's German cultural heritage. As we drink deeply the rich wine of these mystic landscapes filled with stunning creations of wide ranging religious devotion and masterful artistry set within great natural beauty and sensitive landscape design, honoring generations of Missourians with their German surnames and amazing life stories Great death simply bows his head and weeps. It's beautiful, Arthur. Thank you very much. Um, so great way to end a really great discussion with you two gentlemen. So thank you very much, both of you, for being here. Mark, especially making the trek to, to our offices to, uh, to discuss with us. Um, both of you have provided really great perspective on three very important topics um, in remembering this wonderful cultural heritage that our state has. Um, thank you everyone who tuned in today uh, for your comments, for your questions. Um, I want to remind you that uh, our last chapter, chapter eight of Explore Missouri's German Heritage, that discussion will take place next month. That date is March, or it is March, April 8th, sorry, April 8th at 10 a.m. Thursday, 10 a.m. second Thursday, um, as it's been the past several months. And uh, I hope we do uh, a great 
wrap up discussion and 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 answer more questions and uh we'll we'll send off this book in a wonderful way i hope so um thank tune you again to, uh tune in to Christmas. see how it all turns out yeah <laughs> we won't spoil the ending for you <laughs> uh a reminder that i'll be sending out that program survey here shortly so uh please take a look at that and let us know how we did today um and again thank you so much uh arthur and mark and everybody we will see you next month thank bye you. everybody thank you